morning, Mesa. This morning's scripture will be coming from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. That's Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire of him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought his peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you, Elijah. What a great day to be able to worship God. There are so many good things that God has done and continues to do around us. I'm always amazed. Uh, Peter and Nydia, this is great. I'm really excited for you guys, really glad. I know you've been here sitting in that same spot for a long time, but we're especially glad that uh, now you've put on Christ, and that's just great. So... It's good to have everybody here today. A couple of things coming up. I think you have already heard about Jerry Houston coming. He'll be the 9th to 11th, so you still got a couple of weeks before he gets here. Um, you'll be excited to listen to him. He's going to talk about evangelism, about what that means, about teaching other people. And so you're going to be able to learn some things about how to teach other people from him. And uh, he's been very, very successful in the last several years. I think it was 750 people he had baptized. So the guy knows what he's doing, what he's talking about. So come and listen to him. Uh, I can guarantee he is not boring. So (laughs) he is full of energy and excitement. Another thing we would like for you to do, if you guys are on our email list, you may have gotten a survey about worship. And uh, one of the things the elders have talked about is we want to focus this year on worship and on what that means. And so we're trying to figure out how do you assess worship? How do you figure out how we're doing? Where do we start from? Where do we go? The only way I know is we're going to do a survey now of what you feel about worship now. If you feel it's great, put down it's great. If you feel it's horrible, put down it's horrible. Uh, We just want to know what you think about it from where we are right now. And uh, you're kind of our only gauge, so I don't know how else to do that. Uh, There are forms at the Welcome Center if you're not on our email list. But please get one, fill one out. If you got it in an email, it's much simpler. All you have to do is click on it, and it's not going to get your name, your address, your phone number. Nobody's going to even know what you put down. They're not even going to know all those wonderful things that you said about our worship. All right? So... You will be completely anonymous, but uh, we do need your input, and we do want to know. So, are you satisfied with worship now? And tell us about that, and then in another year, we're going to give it to you again, and give you a chance to say, well, how do you feel now? We'll try a few things and see what we're doing, and we just need some way to be able to know uh, if we're making some improvement, or if things are going the other direction. So, be honest. That's the main thing. We've been talking about Jesus and about our theme for this year. Seek Jesus, find Jesus, and share Jesus. And so we talk, first of all, about people miss Jesus most of the time. Uh, They came looking for Jesus, and they found a baby. And the wise men said, this is great, we found a king. But most people miss Jesus as a baby. They didn't see a king. They didn't understand that. And we talked about realizing the significance of Jesus. Most people don't. They just take him as, well, he's another guy that some people honor. And then they don't know about honoring the Son of God. And so today we want to talk about forgiveness. And the place where Jesus is found is a place of forgiveness. A thousand years before Jesus ever came, Isaiah has prophesied about what was going to happen. And what it was going to look like. And how Isaiah says this is pretty amazing. He says, who's going to believe? Who's going to say? But I want you to know here's what it looks like. And so he gives us this description 
that Jesus was nothing to look at. He wasn't impressive. No one was excited about him from just seeing him. And yet what he did is so incredible. And he gives you the description here of what Jesus did in order to make forgiveness possible. And so he talks about he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, and all of the things that God put on him. He was despised and rejected. He's the one that was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. In fact, I put these down just so that you'll be able to see. There are that many words that describe the horror that Jesus is going to go through in one passage. That's a lot. Would you want to do this? I don't think anybody would want to do this. But in order to make forgiveness possible, Jesus says, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to take your place. I'm willing to be the one who does that. There's such great violence in this passage. And yet it's just describing something that isn't even going to be around for another thousand years. But Jesus fulfills all of this. He fulfills all of the violence of this passage because there's a price to be paid for the crime that's been committed. And the crime that's been committed has been done by you and me. How do you get freedom when something's gone horribly, horribly wrong? Well, our world solution is you hire lawyers, right? And that makes everybody happy. No, I think that makes everybody argue. It makes everybody want to get more. and makes everybody want to... And that's our solution to it. Well, we'll just sue. We'll hire lawyers. We'll find a way. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't say, I'm going to demand all the punishment from you. He says, I'll just pay the price. And that's what he did. That's what redemption and justice are all about, is when that price has been paid. It's when the person who the crime was done to accepts, here's the loss, and here's what's going to happen. So, if somebody burns down your house, how do they get forgiveness? Build you a new house, right? Put all the stuff in it that you used to have in it. Is that possible? All the photographs that you had, all the mementos, all the things from... Your folks, all the things from your kids, all the things that they had played with, all the things that mean so much. I don't know that you can even do that and really put all of that back into a house. And yet sometimes we want to go with the replacement theory is that payment is about replacement. But it really isn't. Payment for the crime is not just restitution. And that's a serious crime. If somebody killed your child, for example, they say, oh, we'll just get you another one. Yeah. Right? That would work. I mean, a child's a child. You say, but mine was good. Mine obeyed. Mine did everything I asked. You're going to get me one and, yeah, I don't want that one. I want the one I had. Okay, of course, if you've got the other kind, maybe you're good with the deal. So, who knows? But what I'm trying to say is that it's not just an equal trade. It's not just about restitution. That's not what it's about at all. Major crimes or moral crimes are not about property restitution. But they're more about pain and loss and abuse and terror and horror and shame for what was done to the person about humiliation, about emotional damage, about a crime that's not just physical loss, but it's about emotional loss. It's about guilt, it's about fear, it's about a change in personality because now you become a victim and you can't get out of it and you can't think any different for the rest of your life. And it takes such a toll that you find yourself alone and lost. How do you get justice for that? Well, I think that's kind of the thing that Jesus is talking about. And I think we understand the basic principle of what forgiveness is all about. Is that somewhere the price has got to be paid for the crime that was done. And all of us have have done the crime. All of us have done things that are not correct and not right. And things that are against God and things that are against each other. 
We just don't live very long without doing that. We understand the rules. We knew. But then sometimes, you know, it's just what has to happen. And we don't do it right. So what I want to look at today is what happens when you're caught in the middle of the sin. Does that ever happen? Yeah, I didn't get any hands up, did I? I didn't expect any hands up, did I? But when you start looking about what happens with Jesus and the way this is, I want us to just look at what happens to this. Luke chapter 22 and verse 59 is Peter standing in the courtyard at Jesus' trial. And as Peter stands in the courtyard at Jesus' trial, he's just trying to watch. He's by a fire. He's trying to get himself warm. He can see the trial. He had run away, but now he's come back and he's kind of sitting there and he's kind of trying to pay attention to what's going on at the trial. He's not a soldier. And and people are starting to bother him and ask him what he's doing. In fact, they're saying, I think maybe you're one of them. And so first a servant girl and then another man comes up. I think you're one of them, aren't you? Weren't you a disciple with him? And then verse 59 says, And after an interval about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. How horrible to be caught right in the middle of the sin. And God knows And he turns around and he looks at you. That's one of those things that must be amazing. Well, but other people had said it. They said, you're one of them. And he just, no, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. I don't even know the guy. Because he knows they're guessing. He knows they don't quite understand. They're guessing. Aren't you one of them? It's a question in their mind. They're pretty sure pretty confident, especially as you get to the third guy. Yeah, I think you're, you're Galilean. That's where he did a lot of his preaching. It's you. But when Jesus turns and looks at him, there's no denying it. There's no saying, no, I don't know him, because he knows and you know exactly what happened. There's no excuse, because if he can hear the trial, the trial can hear his denial. Because I don't think it's quiet. I think he's upset and angry. No, I don't know him. And you get this look. And it says, Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. He had just done the Lord's Supper. The blood of the covenant... And they'd all drank the grape juice. This is blood of the covenant. They know he's going to die. And so what's the price for denial? What has to be paid for the sin of denying your own God? It's a cross. And it's going to happen in just a few hours. And that look of Jesus says, and I'm going to pay for this. Because that look of Jesus is all about, I know where you are. I know what's been done. I know how things are going here, Peter. But I want you to think about Jesus and about how this is going to be. Because that look always to me was like, oh man, you ever gotten the evil eye from your mom? I mean, everybody's got that, right? I don't think you can be a mom if you don't have an evil eye so that you can keep your kids in line. I mean, it just comes. It's just, I don't know how they all get it, but they all get it. And they know how to give you that look that says, you're caught and you're not getting out of it. And that's what I always assume. This is the evil eye. This is the, you're caught. I know your sin. You're the one who's guilty. You're the one who did this. I just heard you say it. And I'm not sure that that's the case. Because we do realize that Jesus had already told him about this, right? Jesus had already said before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. 
And so when it happens, Jesus isn't surprised. He knows it's coming. He knows it's going to be there. He knows exactly the timing. And that's why he looks. Because he also said to Peter, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. From the very time before Peter had ever thought to say it the very first time, Jesus said, I know you're going to sin, I know it's going to happen, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. He already knew it all. He had already said it all. He had already told him, this is what's going to happen. So I'm not sure Jesus is so upset at the fact that he caught Peter. He knew Peter was going to do it. He's standing watching Peter. And he wants Peter to know that he knows. And there's no place to hide. But the look, I think, says, come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. Yeah, you did it wrong. But come on, Peter. I'm the one here to forgive. I'm the one here who's about to go to a cross and I'll pay for that. If you'll come back and strengthen your brothers. You ever been caught like that? We like the prodigal son story much better. We do. I mean, it just is a nicer, neater story, don't you think? I mean, you've got this father who's got lots of money, and he has two sons, and the son says, give me my money. And he takes the money, and he goes to a far country. And he spends the money in wickedness away from the father. So the sin isn't where the father saw him actually doing it. You know, it's away. It's somewhere else. It's far off, and he then runs out of money, has to find a job, feeds pigs, and decides that, you know what, I need to come to myself, and I need to come to my father, and I need to go back and ask for a job. And so he comes to himself, and he comes back, and he asks for the father, and the father's been watching, and the father runs out and waits. And the son repents. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Please accept me as a servant. And we know how the father responds. He gives him the ring. He gives him the robe. He gives him all the things that would allow grace and bring him back into the family and make him part of it. He doesn't get more inheritance. But he gives him everything about family that comes back into that. And so God accepts him. And that's our timing. That's the way we like it much better. We can go off somewhere in sin. Then we come back to God. We don't like it if God's watching us doing it. But I think we've got it wrong. I think God's watching us doing it. And the scriptures begin to talk about this idea. And, and certainly Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. But I'm not sure it was all that timing that it was all about. You know where he's off and wanders and looks away. And we like that space in between. We sin, pause, wait a little bit. And then, okay, we repent, pause. And God's shocked, oh, you've sinned? Pause, wait a little while. God knows it all, God knows everything. But, you know, he's just discovered our sin, of course. He doesn't know. I think we like the time out kind of punishment. Not the one where you immediately get spanked. You know, it's like, put me in a corner, God. I'll sit there and I'll feel bad about my sin. It's terrible. It's awful for what I've done. And then after I've spent enough time in the corner, thinking about how what a terrible person I am, then I'll come back to you. And then you can forgive me because you'll be done being mad. Because God, I want you to be mad for a while. You know, because I did it. Yeah, I did it far away. You didn't know about it, but now you found out about it and I can come back. And then we've got it all messed up. Because that is not how Jesus actually does it. 
Jesus is the one actively involved in our forgiveness and our sins are all laid upon him and the punishment he pays for is I think what we have to understand. There's a passage in John 8 that's you know, kind of one of those questionable passages that talks about the woman caught in the middle of adultery. Okay, So they caught both of them, they just bring the woman. Being caught in the middle of a sin, what a horrible thing especially something like adultery, and then you're dragged out, and so here you are, and there's no hiding the shame. There's no hiding where you are. They only bring her. And the question is, the law says to stone her. What do you say? And they're really trying to trap Jesus and find something strong, wrong with Jesus so that they can stone him. And it bothers us with the timing because Jesus doesn't condemn her. He doesn't jump up and say, oh, she's innocent. Nobody's going to say that. He also doesn't say, no, she's guilty. It's obvious she is. So what does he do with somebody caught in the middle? Well, to the ones bringing, he says, let the guy without sin cast the first stone, which silences all stones. And I think Jesus' point is, how do you move on? How do you go from here? How do you make progress? What's your next step? You've already been caught. You're already in the middle. Jesus has already given you the look. And it's not a look of go to your corner and sit for a while. I think we would assume that. We would want that. Go feel guilty for a while because that's what's required. Right? We have to go and... No, he skipped all of that and he says, let's not do this again. He asks her even, does, does anybody condemn you? She says, no. There's no stones. He says, I'm not going to either because we're going to make progress with this. Let's not do this again. Let's not sin anymore. Jesus has already moved through it. And when you meet him in the middle, caught in the middle of your sin, he is already moving forward in it. It is not a time out. It is not a sitting in grief. But somewhere we seem to have adopted that whole idea and think that whole idea is how it's supposed to happen. And so we wait to be forgiven. What are you waiting for? Well, we've done the sin, then we have to feel bad. Then we have to feel bad some more. Then someone tells us they know, and so we feel bad some more. And then they talk us into doing something about it, and so we feel bad some more. And maybe then after a lot of feeling bad, we'll ask for forgiveness. Does God wait to forgive? Another example is what we see in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching to the crowd who has crucified Jesus, and he gets to the end of his sermon after proving that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ, he wants them to know that. And of course, they know what they did to him. And that's kind of his last line, his last conclusion about it all. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness, and he continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So Peter is preaching, the Spirit has been poured out. There's the sound of hurricane and the sound of fire, and the, you can see the fire that's on the people. And the, they gather to see what's going on. 
And Peter tells them about Jesus and then about how they crucified Jesus. Because after all, they were ones shouted, yes, crucify him. They know that they are the ones who are guilty because it wouldn't have happened without them. Pilate had tried to release him. And they can't bring him back. There is no amount of restitution that can bring him back. No matter even if they tried to pay for it. I'll let you kill my child, right? That would be the payment. That doesn't help. And so what does forgiveness look like? And Peter tells him, it looks like you could move on from here. Because the reason he did that is so that you can be his disciples, so that you can have this Holy Spirit, so that you can have this forgiveness. And that's why he paid the price for all of this. And he tells them to repent and make a covenant with God by being baptized into Christ. And they form together as a church. And Jesus died for them on purpose so that they might be forgiven. It's the first time it gets to be proclaimed and announced. Forgiven is the main point of why Jesus died. And it took them 50 days to realize the sin. It didn't take Jesus 50 days to start forgiveness. We know that. We know Jesus paid it all. Isaiah tells us that. And that's what Peter is saying. Jesus has paid it all. But when did that occur to Jesus? When did that happen to Jesus? When was he aware? I don't want to take you back to Luke 23. The scene of the crucifixion. Two others were criminals. They were led away and put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull there, they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ." Of God, his chosen one. Jesus' first words from the cross Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Really? Did they know? Well, it seems to me you don't accidentally crucify somebody, do, do you? It seems to me you would know that you were crucifying somebody. And it seems to me they knew his name was Jesus. And they're yelling for crucifixion. They know that they're about to crucify somebody. And they knew Jesus claimed to be Messiah. If they didn't know that, just look at the sign on the top of his head. King of the Jews. They knew all this. They knew what was going on. They knew they had asked for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be killed. They knew all of this. They knew that Pilate found no guilt in him, and they said, we want to crucify him anyway. They knew, and they took responsibility for it. They said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Does it seem like they didn't know what they were doing? They knew exactly what they were doing. They were killing their own God. Okay, maybe they didn't know that. And I think that's the reason Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. As he looks at the people who are doing it, right in the time when it is occurring, right as they are putting him to death, he looks at them. It's not afterwards like Peter, rooster crows, and he looks and says, I know you did that. It's while they are screaming at him and saying, you go ahead and come down from the cross. As he hangs there, he says, I'm doing this so that the sin you are committing right now can be forgiven. And we always say, forgive me for what I have done. Maybe we need to say, forgive me for what I am doing sometimes. 
Because right in the middle of it, Jesus is still there. He sees it. He, didn't know, he knows it. He didn't hide from him. And it took 50 days for God to confront them. For God to bring the miracle, the sound of the hurricane, that's the best I know, the rushing mighty wind, because, boy, that's got a sound to it. Been there, done that. And for God to confront them, they see who the holy people are. They've got tongues of fire on them. And they realize it's not them. We are not in God's will, and we have crucified the Son of God, and He was forgiving us, and He was in the middle of it. And God is not slow about forgiveness. We are slow to ask. Jesus forgives immediately. He's there right with the thing to say, it's time to be forgiven, and we don't want to be forgiven yet. We have to say, God, send me to a time out first. You know, give me 50 days to feel bad, 50 days to feel guilty, 50 days to know the shame, 50 days to have all the guilt that I killed my own God. And we're the one who makes the excuses. Forgiveness does not change the past. It does change the future. Yeah, we did it. But it's completely gone. It's completely forgiven. Would it change your view of God if you knew He was willing to forgive you immediately? If you knew that while you were doing it, He was saying, come on, don't do it. Okay, now come on, repent. Would it change your view of God? Do you remember a time in Scripture where someone came to him to repent and God says, well, let me think about it. I need to review your past actions. Why don't you put yourself in a time out? But we're the ones that do, does that because we have to have the shame. We have to have the guilt. We have to... You know, if we just turn back to God immediately, we at least have to have the confrontation that we've been caught. What if we didn't even have to have that? What if we could just turn and run to God? And that's the part the prodigal son got right. The father runs. He's been ready since the middle of the sin. Since the denial, since the... And he watched us to see if we wanted to be forgiven, to see what would happen. To forgive is to set a prisoner free. And discover that prisoner is us, because we are the ones who's been set free. And we realize the Spirit has not been poured out on us. And that we're not the ones with fire and that we don't have that, but we can have it by our baptism into Christ, by making that covenant. And God is waiting on us. I guarantee you, He is not waiting on, you are not waiting on Him. He has been ready. And the whole question is how much longer do you want to carry your own shame? That's the whole thing. Do you want to stay in your time out longer? Do you want to delay the fact that you could have forgiveness? Do you want to delay your own freedom? Let me feel bad a little bit longer, God. Or are you ready today to say, you know what? He saw me from the very time I did it. And he says, strengthen your brothers. Come back, repent, be baptized into Christ, make that covenant. Because what he wants is let's move forward. Can you do that today? Let's do it while we come and while we stand and sing.